I am Loretta Vitalisaks. I'm chairperson of Helping Hands University Park, and it's nice to see everybody here on this super hot uh, day. I would like to welcome you to our fifth uh, corridor conversation, and uh, briefly, the Route 1 villages that are part of this are Helping Hands University Park, Hyattsville Aging in Place, uh, whose chair is Lisa Walker, who unfortunately has family commitments this weekend, but we've got Jean Venus here, who's a board person, and I'm not sure if we have anybody else. Um, Neighbors Helping Neighbors College Park, which is headed by John Payne, and Explorations on Aging College Park, which is represented here by Marianne Hayes. We've been holding these monthly. Uh, you can see the ones that we have finished and you can listen to any of these. We began in February and we've had these four. You can, uh, Carter has um, recorded all of them and you're welcome to listen to them. They've all been terrific. So uh, today I'm so excited that we have Barbara Johnson, uh, who lots of you know because you've taken uh, creative agent classes with her but maybe you didn't know all of this about her. She's, been, despite her youthful looks, she's been an artist and educator for over 40 years. She founded Artworks Now with a vision of increasing accessibility to visual arts education across economic and ability spectrums. She is a passionate advocate for social justice who sees access to visual art education as an important civil rights issue. Her research and passion for lifelong learning opportunities for older adults has expanded over the past decade. As we see with the people here, the creative aging classes that are just wonderful draws us to anything related to Artworks Now. When you view the Artworks Now website, you'll see the reality of her vision that the arts enrich the lives of everyone they touch. A working artist whose paintings have been exhibited internationally, Barbara has taught at colleges around the country, including the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, DePaul University, and the University of Texas. In addition to her work as an educator, Barbara brings several, several years of experience in management, marketing, and merchandising in the art supply retail industry, along with her work as a nonprofit executive. She is a candidate for the master's in art education degree from Cutstown University of Pennsylvania, which will be her second master's degree. And she is the recipient of their Outstanding Scholar Award for her work advancing art education nationally. As you are about to experience, Barbara is a joyful and enthusiastic educator and presenter. She firmly believes that art works to transform lives and she is dedicated to creating the world she imagines. And if I only wish we could get there, uh, a world that is kind, equitable, and creative. So we're gonna keep people muted. As I already said, this is being recorded and will be available on our different websites uh, within a week or so. Carter Ross is, is just so good at editing and, and getting things online for us. Uh, Barbara's gonna ask you to put to respond to a question in the chat, and then I will read some of the responses. And then our process will be similar to what we've done in previous uh, quarter conversations. We will wait to have questions until Barbara's finished or until she asks for them, but you can put them in the chat box as we go along and I will read them later on. And if you don't yet have a piece of paper, a writing implement, and an interesting object, uh, you should go ahead and do that. Get those really quickly as Barbara uh, begins and addresses us with her question. Barbara, over to you. Well, Loretta, you, I'm kind of famous for always crying in my presentations. Um, and you've broken the record because um, you made me cry already when you said, if we could only get there, um, amen. Um, but I want to say thank you um, to you and to Carter, who we go way back um, working with Carter's kids and um, enjoying um, all those years, uh, almost 10, if not 10. Um, and I want to thank everyone um, at Hyattsville Aging in Place. I, I, I love the mission. I love the idea. When, when, when we um, did the addition to the house that we live in, 
it was with the idea that we would never leave here except for that one way. Um, so uh, one of the things that's the most important for me as a teaching artist is to learn a little bit about the people that I'll be learning with. And so um, as this is built as a conversation, I'd like to hear some something from you as we get started. Um, and then I'll talk and uh, uh, Loretta said it's a little bit of a psychology lesson. Um, we'll do an exercise and then we can get into more conversation. So for this first part, I'd like to ask each of you a, a sort of a multi-pronged question and you can sort of pick out whatever works for you, whatever resonates um, and put your response in the chat. So. I'd like to know what you're hoping to learn more about today. And within that might be things like, are you interested in learning about the specific health benefits of art making? Are you feeling alienated from creativity in the arts? And, and you wanna know if you have to be Georgia O'Keeffe in order to reap the benefits of art making. Uh, do you want more resources about where and how to get started on a journey of exploring your creativity? Um, or anything else that comes to your mind about um, what prompted you to come today and and have this take take part in this conversation um, or really anything else so if you want to if you want to put those um, in um, I'm gonna get started well no I need to have Loretta share a couple questions with me um, just so or maybe we'll just hold that because I'm not seeing questions show up. So it might be that you're taking a while to formulate and write. So why don't I get started? Um, oh, wait, Loretta, you've got one. What is it? Oh, they're coming in. All right, so uh, I would love to hear about other resources, learn more about my own creative process. Great, great. Other people are thinking. Okay, okay, so while you think I'll, um, I'll get started. So, uh, wait, Alyssa. I've been writing free form poetry, but only did a bit of art with a student I tutored. So I would like to know about health benefits of doing huh, bad art. No such thing as bad art, right? Except for that when I was a grad student in Wyoming, we actually did have what we called the bad art show. So we um, uh, like intentionally made really bad art and it was actually really great. So I think you're right. So um, with that, I'm gonna share my screen, wish me luck. Uh, I think it's gonna work. It did work, okay. So, um, so I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about sort of the whole span um, of the benefits of art across our, across our ages. Um, the, the reason I founded Artworks um, was because of the impact that the visual arts had on me as a young person. Um, I'm the youngest of four siblings, um, the youngest by far, and I grew up kind of being this weird, like, in-between kid, like, an only child who had siblings. Um, and I had a lot of time to be in my head, which um, left me a lot of time to imagine. Um, thankfully, I also had a little pan of Cray Crayola watercolor paints, and a really crummy brush. Um, and I have to say, I was born uh, an abstract expressionist, um, and that didn't garner a lot of compliments from teachers or any adults, really. Um, so then when I was around eight, um, my older sister took an art class in high school, and um, idolizing all things she did, I sat down beside her, and she was actually sitting at an easel, so that was like, how cool was that? I was really impressed. Like she was already an artist in my head. Um, and she was drawing from a book from school. And so I didn't have that book. So I picked up a magazine and a pencil and paper. And um, some of you might remember this name. I drew a picture of Chad Everett. <laughs> I see the laughs. Um, and I'll never forget the response. All of the adults were wowed by how much it actually looked like Chad Everett. And um, I think they were being generous, but I do think they saw a spark of raw ability that they had not seen yet with the abstract expressionism. Um, and I'd never before felt that level of accomplishment. Um, so I immediately added portraiture to my body of work. Um, 
but I did, I never did abandon abstraction um, to the dismay of many an art teacher. Well, this one experience altered the course of my entire life, literally. Um, art worked on me that day and it continued to work and to work to work on me and to work in me and to work through me. And by the time I was 12, um, I'm gonna stop and say, I'm the child of a, um, a mother who um, was from the Midwest, who uh, was a Virgo, who was Lutheran um, and German and very, 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 very practical. And so in order to sort of, um, uh, sort of construct a case for how it would be okay for me to study art, um, I started researching careers in the arts and figured it out uh, how I was gonna make a living and uh, thanks to the New Carrollton Library. Um, anyway, all of this took place in Prince George's County. So fast forward a couple dozen years and um, I've lived, in, I went to graduate school in Wyoming, uh, taught in Texas, uh, moved to Chicago, um, taught in Chicago, uh, fell in love and moved back home. And I was teaching out of my studio and doing some adjunct work and, um, and focusing really on my painting and my, my studio practice. Um, and I, I think I can't even count the number of times I would have this vision of, I should start a fill in the blank. Sometimes it was garden related, sometimes it was art related, sometimes it was food related, but I wanted to start something that would bring like justice, some element of um, a better world. And um, well, it just kind of settled with the idea that like, I don't really know, although I do have a garden this year, I don't really know about gardening or farming and I don't really cook. So I couldn't really do that. But the, the thing I knew and the thing I knew deeply um, was art. And so as much as I really imagined this center to become sort of a life center, um, which may happen one day, um, uh, the focus started with art. And it started actually with an intergenerational class of teens and adults. And the community really wanted more classes for small children. and we've always been really focused on um, listening to our community and asking and, and receiving that information. Um, so thanks to a great partnership with the city of Hyattsville, we began something called Hyattsville is Home. And um, that was my first introduction to working with older adults. And I fell in love with uh, some of you on this screen um and the work that you were doing and the discoveries you were you were making and then the um the national guild for community arts education developed something called catalyzing creative Age aging which is an institute where we could um if accepted we could learn like really intelligently all about how to to do this work um, at the most elevated level. Um, it's really important that our teaching artists who teach eight-year-olds don't walk into the next room and teach a 60-year-old because we don't want that. <laughs> um, we respond very differently. And so there's a, there's a, there's a very different set of, of skills. So, uh, so we did the work with the uh, Catalyzing Creative Aging program, and, um, and then we had our, um, our pilot, um, uh, Painting Fundamentals, um, and that was in the fall of 2019. And just as we were getting started on the third iteration, um, uh, the pandemic uh, came in. Well, in short, and then I'm going to stop, but this pandemic has really brought us a whole new level of engagement with adults from 20 to 60 or 20 to 55, where we didn't have that. And so that's been a very interesting piece for us. And so I want to talk about 
what we've been continuing to learn and and do that through Erickson's. Uh, okay, now it's going to do that. Okay, so Erickson Erickson stages of psychosocial development. Here comes your Psych 101 class. Um, so one of the things that's important while you are looking at this and saying, I'm 50, I'm 65, I'm 78, why do I care about what stage I was in when I was four? Um, I think that there, it's just like the stages of grief. They're not really linear. We do a lot of like uh, cycling. Um, I know that uh, I can point to a couple of these that are not uh, chronologically appropriate and say, yeah, yeah, I'm there. I have that. Um, and so I, I and I, I think that uh, sort of breaking it down simply allows us the chance to go back in on our own and, and get into sort of uh, deeper. So um, we are not working so much with three month olds yet, although I really, you know, have this desire to be like, let's make art with three month olds. But um, so most of most most of our programs start with like the 18 month old set. So we're, we're gonna I'm gonna just focus focus there first. So so the idea here is um, that the, our toddlers. Um, the, they're really developing gross and fine motor skills through the use of crayons and paintbrushes. Their hand-eye coordination is benefiting um, greatly by making art. And I want to, I, I want to, again, I'm going to sort of go back and forth. And I want to say something about thinking about fine motor skills and hand-eye coordination and fast forward to thinking of someone who may have had a stroke and how art like, so while I'm talking in this chronological way, think about how it's bigger than that. Um, so um, so uh, making marks, now here's a really interesting piece for me. Making marks, helps, making marks help the youngest kids experience a sense of self. You notice the kid on the left, that kid's hands are in that paint and they're just moving it. They're not interested in drawing what they see. They're not interested in like sending you a message. They're interesting, interested in seeing that they exist. This, this work is reflecting back to them that their actions have outcomes. So, oh my gosh, like I'm moving my hand in this red paint and look how it's changing. It's a very physical stage. Um, for them. And, um, you know, some of us wish that we never got out of that because some of these things that they make are amazing. Now, um, we go to the three to five year olds and, um, oh my gosh, this camp, I'll never forget the signs that these kids made. And they were, they were mostly four and five year olds. Um, so at this point, they're beginning to reflect from memory about things that they see. So, so you, you'll see like in his picture, he's got that Nike symbol because it's all over half of his clothing. So, you know, back in my day, you know, I did a picture of my mom or my siblings and me and whatever. Um, so, you know, he's drawing things from his memory uh, uh, that are important to him. Um, the other things that happen, uh, at this point, art is helping to build neural connections. It's, it's further improving fine motor skills. Scribbling is, and you see his scribbling with his purple marker action going on there. Scribbling is a precursor to writing. So in this way, visual art is often like our second form of communication um, after verbal and before writing. And he did not write, don't hit animals. He, um, you can see he, sort of worked with an adult to make the letters and then and then worked with an adult to paint those in but the background is all his and and the message um and that's where we get to the next piece which is creating pictures and expressing themselves in paint really helps children at this age develop self-esteem and confidence and if this guy isn't the like poster kid for self-confidence and self-esteem I, I i i haven't seen one um, this is the age where I hear our kids say, I am an artist. No apologies, no like, um, and I'm gonna go to art school and find out how to be a better artist. I 
and here I'm fully realized I am an artist. No questions, no questions. Um, that is a very particular fleeting moment. And it's actually all of my life's work is about bringing that moment forward for all of us. It's not about sending us back, but it's about bringing that moment forward because we, we are all creators and we are all artists. So um, that's, if there was one thing I could say about how art works, that's, if you had, if you made me say one thing, that's what I, that's what I would say. Now, if you look here, it's this, this initiative versus guilt and purpose. Again, you know, this, this young man has made a sign that says, don't hit animals. He's living out that sense of needing to have purpose and taking initiative to, and you know how kids this age are like, they tell us things like smoking is bad for you and don't litter. And they're really like righteous souls about uh, about these things that they're learning about and that's it's that's just it to me that is like it's an extraordinary stage um so then we get to school age kids now this is a tough time this is where um their critical skills begin to outpace their technical abilities and it's around this age, eight, nine, that we stop saying, I'm an artist. And what I hear kids say is, I can't draw. And they walk away. Now, in some cases, they're finding other interests. And they're, they've, they've decided that they're really a soccer player. But, but the fact that they walked away saying, I can't, that's, uh, for me, that's like a wound. Um, and it's a wound that uh, I'm preempting myself, but I hear a lot about that wound in my life and in my work with adults. At Artworks, we, we wanna bridge this gap from I am an artist to I can't draw. And the way we do this is by focusing on self-expression and focusing on working with um, uh, unusual materials and taking less of the pressure taking the pressure off of the idea of making something look like something and putting the emphasis on self-expression. And so that we're, so, so on the left, you see a, a portrait made with cutting out, uh, a, you know, collage magazine pictures. And on the right, it's a, it's a 3D collage. And so they can, they can have an idea. And then as you're working in a medium like collage, um, there's a kind of a mediation that happens where you say, I have this image, but you're willing to be a little looser with how things come together. And it's sort of more of a relationship or a conversation with the materials. And you don't get caught in the I can't draw paradigm because we're not asking you to. Um, so by doing this, we're developing their creative thinking and we're staying away from that um, this doesn't look like my mom. I'm not, a, I'm not an artist. Um, and you see how it connects in with, with Erickson in that inferiority is the, is the, is that crisis place and then competency. And so their kids this age are very hard on themselves about competency. And, and most of the kids we work with are in this age group. And it's really important to us that they are sort of buoyed through this, through this crisis. And this is when they really get it. And they are filled with that sense of competency. And this was after a camp that we did where we did art and food. And then we had our annual chef's dinner and these young people made one of the hors d'oeuvres and then um, they visited the chef's dinner and um, served our guests and, uh, signed autographs. So um, talk about competency. Um, so now we're at teens. Now for me, I, there's a part of me that will always be a teen. So I'm just going to say it right there. Um, and teens, um, teens approach art with like, they're like purpose driven. Um, and 
And while Erickson talks about identity versus confusion, there's, I see a lot of this as like purpose driven in that it's um, employing art uh, in a, as some sort of use. So something like, I, I want to make this thing, I want to make a costume or I want to make my own shoe, you know, color, you know, like if I, if I, like there are a million like pairs of white all, Chuck Taylor all stars um, that um, kids get paint markers and paint them. And so like, and they don't feel like they have to be um, like the world's greatest artist to do that, to make these designs. They also um, often want to tell the world about an important social justice issue to them. So like it could be protest art or it could be sort of more of a spiritual thing. And that's what we see on the left. Um, and this is from one of our teen camps and it's a self portrait um, where the artist used sticks and flowers and you see the quote is without salt, food has no taste. Um, uh, and then what, uh, without you, life has no meaning. Well, the other material besides the sticks and the flowers is actually salt. So when she picked that piece of paper up, it disappeared. The whole design disappeared. So that's a very unique teenager mindset too, is it's employing art for this purpose and there's often not a sense that that uh, that it needs to be um, permanent, which is really fascinating. Um, there's also the purpose of I want to tell you about myself. I want to tell the world about myself. And you see this uh, in the image on the right. Um, this young woman is really she's got something to say about who she is, and um, she doesn't really want to stand up in front of her school mates and give a speech. She wants to make this thing in private and then let it speak for her. So there's this great thing with visual art at this stage where it can stand in for you and you can step back and you've got a little safety. And that was a huge part of the work of uh, my work as an artist uh, growing up was, you know, when I was younger, I know it might be hard for some of you who know me to believe this, but I did not like talking to people like um, very much. And um, I was pretty shy and um, Loretta's house just fell down. So, um, but, <laughs> but I, my art spoke for me. And in fact, then turned around and gave me the confidence to speak um, actual words. Um, but far fewer teens are, uh, uh, think they're artists than uh, five-year-olds. Um, they are racked with self-doubt. And of course, it gets into that identity piece. So as you can see, what we do is we often work with um, non-traditional materials, which it, it makes, they're very well suited for like thinking outside the box um, and, and, and they take, they blow the box open, like way beyond what we would imagine. Um, so now we're, let's get to the adults. So there are basically three adult stages and, and they start to really blur for me anyway. This first one is our, our 20s and 30s. And we're looking at um, intimacy versus isolation. It's the do I get married years? Do I have a family years? And all of those things. And we are looking at the virtue of love. Now, this piece is really interesting. It's actually photographs of different people that the artist knew. And in the eye, the area that is the, the eyeball, um, there is, she wrote letters to them. So the color is actually colored markers. Um, that make up their eye color, um, that have messages that she wants to share with them, which really is, she's trying to break that intimacy isolation tension um, uh, with, with this piece, which is, uh, it's, it's, it's spectacular to me. Um, I wanna talk about, um, I don't know, I, I get stuck on this piece because I'm like, I wish I could just blow it up and you could see the whole thing. Um, but I'm gonna go to the next 
stage, the 40 to 65 year old stage. And then I'll open up more to what we're doing with creative aging. So this piece is another mind blowing piece. Um, this piece is done by someone that's in one of my uh, open studio classes. And so between 40 and 60, we're really looking at the, you know, it's that midlife crisis thing that people talk about. Um, and it's the, it's the question of, uh, am I, am I going to keep generating um, or am I going to stagnate? I think that's the question we ask. And then caring really hinges on that in a lot of ways. Am I going to continue to care about the world? Am I going to continue to care about others? Am I going to be cared for? And so this piece was done in the, um, well, you can tell it was done around the time when there were 220,000 people in the United States who had died from COVID-19. So this artist kept a journal and did paintings um, where she made hash marks and counted um, all of the people. And she really wanted to do this in a mindful and caring way because of the way that our culture has treated that number um, so coldly. And she also included in this um, body of work, she um, would pick out people that she found out about and she would do a, a small portrait of them and talk about them and their, and their life a little bit. Um, so 65 and better integrity versus despair and wisdom so i think that we can all say that um that we believe in the idea that we have the potential to develop wisdom as we get older um and you know integrity to me is a funny way of expressing it but um but but definitely the sense of like contentment um versus despair or engagement versus despair. And um, so, so to sort of like pull the, 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 the adult ages together, I want to say that, that um, what I found in my work with teaching adults, because I, I don't teach small children because I'm not that smart to teach small children, because you have to be really smart and wily and like, I don't know, like, I don't know, like maybe like be like a Hindu goddess with like 700 arms or like there's this quality that people who work with little teeny people and like I can hang out with little kids for like ever, but I can't teach them because I don't know how to keep track in my head. Well, you know, when you say something like, and here's a picture of a lizard and then a kid says, I have a pet lizard. And then another kid says, my sister, can draw a lizard and then another kid says my brother is an artist and then another kid says and it goes it's like that commercial for like when you go to check you know you go to uh search google or something and it takes you and you go down the rabbit hole so i i'm not good at that so um i don't teach children <clears throat> but my work with adults i really find that one of the first thing that adults say to me um especially in the early days when I was the teacher at Artworks, um, is when I was a kid, I was an artist. And, and again, they don't say, when I was a kid, I could draw. They actually say, when I was a kid, I was an artist. So they just went back to the I am an artist statement. And then they say, they go right to the next step and say, um, but then I just, I don't know what happened, but around eight or so, I just, I lost it. I just stopped. And I don't know why, um, or in worse, they do know why. And they share a story about being traumatized by a judgy art teacher, which is the, it's the most heartbreaking part of my work is hearing the stories of um, art teachers who turn people away from their creativity. So many of you know about our creative aging program, and it is for adults 55 and up. <clears throat> um, I, I think 
this is where it gets really hard for me um, because I'm here. So, um, so I'm 60 and, and I'm, I started out by um, bringing in creative aging uh, programs to our organization. I was, a, what was I, 57? Um, so I was still technically able to be in the class. Um, but as time has moved forward, um, I'm more and more identifying myself as an older person. And, um, and I've really been educated about the, um, some, sometimes experientially, about ageism. And, um, and so this has really become where, where Loretta talked about in my bio that, um, that uh, uh, my, my advocacy for art education and access uh, for children, um, my really new cause for breathing is really that I want everyone, and particularly everyone 55 and up, to have access to making art because because everything they said about about this greatest um, like culminating uh, uh, stage of our lives and and the 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 propaganda that that we're in decline. Um, I now know because I'm here that it's not true. Um, it's 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 really. Um, it's, it's really, it's, I think it's told to us often by people who are younger and projecting that they, that they aren't gonna be something or have value or a little bit of like, grandma drives me nuts, grandpa makes me crazy, I don't know. Um, but we do tend to stop seeing people as who they are, right? Um, as they get, as, as they, as we get older. Um, I want to say to you that what, one of the most exciting things about our creative aging class for me is, is um, the courage, is the courage that each one of our participants um, has making art. And, you know, I'm going to be the first to say that if, if I want to take a class in, an, in an, something I don't know about or know how to do, you know, the age old fear that comes back to me is like, I don't want to look stupid. Well, you know, I don't know if our creative aging people um, had to overcome the fear I would have to overcome to walk into that room to draw for the first time in 40 years or ever. But, um, but I, am, it, I am continuously like just bowled over by by the courage and i think it goes to that piece about wisdom right I, I i think that you develop that that wisdom so so i want to talk about um those benefits now so here you go so the really cool thing about art versus exercise or a meditation class is that when you're making art you're actually, it, it, you're connecting your mind and your body. Meditation helps your mind, physical exercise helps your body. But when you, when you combine um, movement um, with the stillness that's required to make art, you're actually making connections that are not otherwise made. So here are some particular benefits. Um, of making art as an older adult. And I should have this as a slide, as a list, but I don't. So I'm just gonna say them. And if, if one catches your attention, um, make a note and, and come back and, and, and we can talk about it. <clears throat> so art is naturally relaxing. So our muscles um, get more relaxed. It reduces stiffness and it actually reduces inflammation. Um, Drawing and painting are light activities and can help promote better dexterity and blood flow. So, so right there, you see two things that talk about things like blood pressure. And we go back, we, I hear dexterity, and I remember dexterity from being a kid. And, you know, like I know that, you know, after, after a full day, my hands are stiff. 
So just p picking up a pencil and drawing helps to like release some of that sort of fluid buildup. Um, here's a controversial one, and that is improved vision. I've never really found the, the, the actual reason for this, but what I hear are the two options. One is that it, the drawing and painting, that you're using your eyes and you're strengthening the muscles. Well, I think that could go either way. But what I really think happens, and, and where I've seen more credibility to this argument, is that we realize that our eyeglass prescription hasn't been filled in a long time. We haven't updated it. And as we're looking at that thing we want to draw, it's not quite sharp. And we go to the eye doctor and we get an update in our prescription and now we can see better. Well, that, and along with a few other pieces, makes it so that we fall less. That's kind of, that like blows my mind. So making art improves neural connections. It improves cognitive function. Self-expression can, of course, be cathartic and therapeutic. Um, in classes like ours, where our program, so the, the Catalyzing Creative Aging program we went through, insisted that a, a, ma a major component of the work includes socializing. And so uh, it, you're, you're provided with opportunities to meet like-minded people. Um, this one I really love, and, and it kind of pulls me back to the teenager piece. Creating new perspectives. Um, so you have opportunities to think differently. You know, teenagers are really stubborn. You know, they think it's this way and it's this way, and that's the way, that's the only way it is. But with art, they they expand. And I think with art at our ages, I think we get the chance to expand. Um, of course, going back to the sort of social piece, decreasing isolation, um, that the benefits just from decreased isolation alone include improved mood and better physical health. So we get a, go back again to fewer falls. There's, there's documented evidence. It, there's a, there was a 12 month study done by Jean Cohen at George Washington University. Um, and there were two control groups, one group, um, had no arts activities, no art making, no art museum trips, none of that. And the other had a very specific arts, art making and art viewing program. The difference is, the differences in the two groups, the group that had art in their lives experienced fewer falls, decreased the types and the amounts of medications they took, decreased the number of visits to their doctor and they experienced better general health and studies show that depression can lead to physical maladies so the thinking is that their mood was elevated and so they had less uh, physical maladies i will say that part of that could be the kind of thing that you probably know about where it's like if you're not busy and you wake up and your back hurts and you're like my back hurts and then you're home all day because there's a pandemic and so all you're doing is thinking like gosh my back still hurts uh what should i do my back hurts my back hurts my back hurts but if you go have lunch with a friend or you go to work or you do things that you couldn't do in the pandemic then it takes your mind off of it and the next thing you know you're like oh like you've even, you've forgotten about your back, but then you go home and then you go like, oh my God, hurts. But, but you get a break. And I think that that's one of the things that I hear a lot from our students is for a couple of hours a week, I forget. I forget how much I hurt. And this is the part where, this is part two with Loretta. Um, to be part of that forgetting. Um, like I can't think of having done anything better in my life. Um, it's, it's, I think it can't be underestimated to have, to, to be part of uh, just making a room where people can go and for two hours have less pain. I think it builds on itself. I think it gives us so much hope. Um, 
which goes back to that despair thing that we don't want. Um, I think that most of you would agree that we saw evidence during the, especially early days of the pandemic, that our, the arts really made a difference in helping us cope. Movies, um, concerts from artists' homes, um, museum visits that you could do virtually. And then you would see your friend would post a picture, like even things like, I got this paint by number set and I'm embarrassed because it's just paint by number, but I love it. And, and for me, people, when they say that to me, it's kind of like when they say something to my spouse about, I made this thing and you're a chef. And so you probably think I'm stupid, but for me, you picked up a paintbrush, you picked up a pencil, you did something. Even if you got a light box and trace something, um, it's, it's, it's having the same physiological and emotional um, effects. And so it makes me thrilled. So uh, if you have any shame around paint by numbers, and I'd like that to go away and go on Amazon or, where, or your local store and buy yourself a paint by number or a coloring book. I don't care. <laughs> it, they all work. Um, so now let's try it out. How about that? So I'm going to, um, there's going to be, oh, oh, there you go. So ta-da, you're an artist. I now knight you. Bing, you're an artist. Um, so now let's, uh, let's get started. So paper, pencil, whatever, and some kind of object. If you don't have an object, you can just use your hand. Um, and what I want you to do is something called contour drawing. Now, look, Carter, the paper moved. We knew it would. But look, I think I've gotten better at being directionally challenged. So there's a thing about this contour drawing. When, when I say, con you know, the contours, the, like of my hand, like this is the contour of my hand, right? These lines, the outline. It's the outline. That's another, contour is just a fancy word for outline. So um, <clears throat> if I'm of a fast mind, um, and you can see me drawing here, if I'm gonna draw the, the contour of my hand, I might go like this. And like, there I go, like really fast, da 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 da. Um, but that's not what I want you to do. That was, by the way, that was this area right here. Um, that's not what I want you to do. I, I want you to draw really slowly. So um, can you pin just um, the, this, this um, window here? Carter, thank you. So I want you to, I'm gonna put something down that you can see. I'll do this. Um, uh, stapler. So what I want to do in drawing the stapler, I'm going to start here. Um, I want to pretend like I'm a bug and I am going along the surface of this stapler. Really now I, funny part is you're going to see it a little differently because I'm going to draw it from actuality, not from the screen. So I'm a little teeny bug. And with my work in the garden, I'm gonna say I'm even smaller than an aphid. Grr, aphid. So I'm really, so I'm right here. Like I'm right there. So, and I only draw when I feel like my eye is kind of touching the surface. And all of a sudden I'll notice my eye will like race ahead and I have to stop. Now I'm gonna come over here just because it's a little more interesting than a forever line. And I'm gonna come down. And I'm going a little too fast. So 
So that's that goes now from here is here to down here is down here. So um, that, that there is another form of contour where it's blind contour, where I, I look at the object here and my hand is over here and I'm not watching my hand. I'm not gonna take us through that. That's a kind of a nightmare all of its own. So, so uh, you, if you would uh, take your paper and whatever drawing implement you have and whatever your item is. And again, if you don't have an item, you've got a hand and I would suggest putting it in a kind of an interesting um, pose instead of just this, because that's going to get boring with those long lines, but something more interesting. And uh, it's 2.58. Let's say we do this for like three minutes in peace. Ready, set, go. So remember, you want to feel like your eyes are touching that line, the line of the object, not the line on the paper. And when you start to speed up, just say, slow down. This exercise is more about how you feel than about how it looks. And it's best if you don't pick the pen pencil up. And if you notice that, well, that wasn't really right, it doesn't matter. And if you're like me, you just notice that your shoulders just relax. We have a couple more minutes. And if you go off the paper like I'm about to do, just go to a place where you can reconnect anywhere and start over, start again, not over.
Okay, I think that's that's been a, a, almost five minutes. Take a peek at the gallery, see how we're doing. Raise your hand if you like physically raise your hand if you're like, I'm done uh, and I'm ready to go on to the next thing. Okay, okay, this one's gonna be a little bit different. Um, does anyone want to hold theirs up and show us? And you don't have to, but if you want to, you can. Great. Cool. Oh, those are great. Man, oh man. Wow. Fabulous, fabulous. Now, I, I'm going to ask you to un unmute for just a second. I'd like to get some feedback about how it felt. Anybody? Frustrating. Frustrating. I don't translate 3D to 2D. I don't, I'm, I see things in 3D, but I, <laughs> I don't know which is what I, it's very hard for me. Ah, uh, okay. So I'm going to label that thinking. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thinking. Okay. That's good. That's good. This is really good. Anybody else have anything to say? Any yeah. Comments? Bobby? Hi. Um, uh, I was frustrated too, but I think for a different reason. <clears throat> I just didn't want to go that slow. <laughs> it was very frustrating to slow down. And, and, uh, and I, I probably didn't go as slow as, uh, as instructed. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It, that's in, that's interesting. Okay, um, thank you for sharing that. Uh, and someone else, I think iPhone. You wanted to say something. Yeah. Hi. How are you? Good. I'm good. Um, I think the hardest part for me was um to go slow, uh -huh. and I noticed that when you kept saying go slow, I would go slow. I also realized something interesting. I don't know if it is related to art or not. But I was actually breathing. Uh, it may sound weird. Everybody breathe, but just actually taking time to breathe and go slow. I don't know. I'm going to take you on the road with me. <laughs> like breathing. I'm actually breathing and thinking and going slow. Um, what, are you comfortable sharing your name or should I just call you iPhone? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, my name is Fawaya. I don't know how to write the name. I'm sorry. Um, Fawaya is my name. So. Fawaya? Fawaya. Um, let me write can, it down. Can you spell it? Okay, it's F as in Frank, A-W-A-Y-A. -A. Gotcha. I was close. I had an S instead of an F. And okay. a lot of people do that too. It's yeah. okay. <laughs> it's that set, you know, it's the hearing aid is what it is. So, um, all right. um, all right. but, but, um, Yes, that, that I found myself a couple of times breathing. I think Loretta, you wanted to say something? I guess along with that, I found it very relaxing. And when I would notice that I was speeding up, I would uh, intentionally slow down. And when I made a mistake, I wanted to reach for my eraser, but I just said, mm, no, this is just, I'm keeping my pencil on the paper and I just, so we'll see what comes mm -hmm. but it was it was a meditative kind of slowing intentionally slowing down which was mm -hmm. lovely that's great anybody else yes jean um, i agree with foya uh, hi foya <laughs> and uh I'm and hi i agree with foya and loretta uh, I forced myself to go slowly to look at my object, which was a, a teacup, and just to go and go very slowly. And I felt relaxed and I felt the breathing also. So I, I see this could be meditative. You could get an object and just each morning just do an outline drawing slowly. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, anyone else? Thank you for that. that, I, that that's... Um... I have something I want to say, but I want to see if anybody else has anything to say before I, I respond to where you're going with that. Okay, so so um, I want to say that one of the so there's a great story about um, 
an, an, in, an, in an ancient Chinese village, uh, I, I, I'm not going to confirm that this is a true story, you know, uh, but in an ancient Chinese village, there was an artist and a man came to the village and said to this great renowned artist, um, I want you to paint me a picture of a, a chicken. And he said, I'm, I, I don't know what the currency was, but we're going to pretend it was dollars because whatever, uh, it's a hundred dollars back in ancient times, you know. And um, so that's $100. Go away and come back next month. But I need the $100 now. He says, I don't like this, but OK. So he gives him the money, and then he goes away. So he comes back in a month, and he says to the artist, hi, I'm that guy. You, you were supposed to do a painting of a chicken for me. I'm here to pick up my chicken painting. And the artist was like, oh, yeah, you. OK, come on. So he takes him into his studio. And there on his easel is a piece of rice paper hung nicely or it's displayed on his desk. Or, and he pulls out this beautiful uh, sumi brush and ink. And he does this amazing painting of a chicken in like a minute and a half. The guy says, Wait a minute, you made me go away for a month. You're charging me all this money and all this time you could have done this in like a minute and a half. This is a ripoff. I want my money back. And the artist says, come here, come here, let me show you. So he takes them over to a corner of a studio where there is like a four foot tall stack of pieces of rice paper. And each one of them has a painting of a chicken on it. And he said, I couldn't get to your chicken until I did these. And so, so I love that story because we all think that we should just be like, boop, I can do it. Like I have hands, I got eyes, God willing, I can do it. So, but the truth is that, you know, a lot of times the people who respond with that, yes, I did slow down and yes, I did breathe. Um, you've had some other um, entree into that kind of work. And so you, you have some experience. You've got a stack of chicken paintings where you can like address it. Um, and, and you'll understand that frustration, that, that sense of like, uh, I don't want to go slow. Um, you know, if you're interested in uh, making a chicken painting, um, it's, it, it is a great um, exercise, like what Jean is saying, to every now and then, uh, or every morning, take 10 minutes and just quietly draw something. Because like for me, I'm the world's worst. My rabbi does a weekly meditation program at 8.30 in the morning, which for me is actually like 5 a.m. And for Alyssa, it's like early because in real, but I, then she talks and then for 20 minutes, it's silent. And I'm like, dude, like, I can't do it. I cannot. I was a Buddhist for 20 years. I failed meditation. That, they did not kick me out though because of that. But, but I, like for me, this right here is the way I meditate. It's, it's this connection of the mind and, and my hand. So um, I'm looking at the time and I'm going to give you this homework assignment instead of having you do this here. Um, and then I'd love to talk more. So here's your homework assignment. Same paper and pencil, or if you want to get out, if you, or go to the store or go on Amazon and get yourself a little inexpensive watercolor set or markers or anything like that. I want you to give yourself, and you can decide the time. It can be five minutes, it could be a half an hour, it could be untimed. I want, I want, I, I want you to give yourself this assignment. Close your eyes and listen to your thoughts. So do this part and then you'll know how to get to the next part. So close your eyes and listen to your thoughts. Are they coming quickly? Are you relaxed? Uh-oh, there's your grocery list. 
Imagine without necessarily using words, what the inside of this mind looks like. You might see it as words, you might see it as pictures. And then realize, watch it change, right? So like right now I'm thinking my eyes are closed. Are they all looking at me and my eyes are closed and does it look okay? And then I'm thinking, oh, the sun is getting brighter. And then I'm thinking I'm supposed to be quiet. And then I'm thinking, what does my mind look like? And then I'm thinking, I became very aware for some reason of my glasses. And it's just going and going and going. So as you do the actual painting, it's gonna keep changing because your mind isn't stagnant. So what I want you to do is I want you to create using words, symbols, shading, lines, whatever comes to you, a recording of what's on or in your mind. And it could be just color, it could be, it could be words, it could be, you know, you can even do a collage. You could do a nice, you could like draw an outline of a head or your head, and then you could collage all the things in there that are on your mind or in your mind. And I think that this, <coughs> excuse me, this works in a lot of ways. And in particular, it works because it helps us to recognize what's in our minds. And it helps us to maybe think, why am I thinking about that? There's nothing I can do. Or, you know, I'm thinking about her, but I haven't called her. Why don't I call her? Or, I mean, there's just so many ways. There's so many things that, that this can bring to us. So that's my um, request to you all that you do a little homework and that, um, and I would love it if you do it. Um, uh, I would love for you to share them. I'm gonna just say, you can share them with me, Barbara at artworksnow.org. Uh, you could also share them with Carter and Loretta um, uh, somehow, and they'll probably tell you how to do that. But I'd love to see if any of you actually do this. And with that, I want to say, um, what do you want to talk about? Rosella, go ahead. You're still muted. Roselli, you're still muted. There you go. I just like to say that it's when you went over what art is good for for us, how it's good for us. The reality is that a lot of this has happened to me in the four, five, almost five years, because I started when it was in Hyattsville, in the sense that. I no longer take a lot of medication. I don't, a lot of my prescription medications are gone. All of my numbers uh, for everything that I need to be concerned about are all down. And um, my daughters are religious about me going to these classes. I didn't know that part, but I didn't know these other things. Yes. and. Um, I am still very, I'm still a very type A, uptight person. That isn't going to change. I'm trying, the Lord knows I'm trying. And, but um, I just think that it really can have an effect on you. It really can. And I just want people to know that I can testify to that. Thank you, Rosella. And Rosella is a great example of, of one of our very first students who, um, who then got more involved with our organization and she is now on our board of directors. And um, she was at, on our website, um, artworksnow.org, there is a tab for creative aging and there's a great video. Uh, um, Rosella was um, gracious enough to share her personal experience um, with the world and um, and it's a mighty powerful experience um, and uh, Rosella um, is 
uh, as you know, um, adored by every person on our staff. And um, as is Jean, um, everyone, I mean, it's, it's uh, one of the hardest things besides some of the personal uh, uh, for us in this pandemic has been <clears throat> like the reason that we exist as artworks has um, has gone into this remote world. And so, you know, I lived for my hugs from our creative aging students and, and, and um, the conversations I would have with Loretta out in the hallway about this rabbi or that shul. And, and, um, and so there, that like that piece, like kind of, um, I'm hoping, you know, and, and, and our creative aging class was the first one that we stopped before any government said anything. Um, we said, it looks like this is harder on older adults. And we questioned everybody. We sent out a poll and the survey was see on zoom. And, um, that's where we've been. And, and I'll tell you that um, we have, we have uh, participants who uh, for a while were, um, were confined to their room in, um, in a nursing home. And I've gotten notes from people about the, our creative aging classes being the only contact with the outside world that, that many had during those months. And um, so I feel really blessed that, um, that this had gotten to the stage it had gotten to so that it was easily transferred to an online format. And it will continue on an online platform, at least one section, because of the fact that there are people who can't get out of their homes or who want to join us maybe from Chicago. And we have great teachers like Robin Hall and Rachel Cross and Raquel and on and on and Barbara. Um, yeah, Barbara who studied with Jean Cohen who did that study about the 12 months. Uh, any other questions, Loretta or anyone? Anybody? Pete. Uh, being uh, new to this, I mean, I, I know about our artworks now. Uh, I live in Hyattsville, I very much, very often, including last night, attend to Pizzeria Paradiso, for example. <laughs> However, no, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of interested and intrigued by this. Uh, I would be in your oldest group, uh, over 65 group, and I'm just curious as to if you will again start in-person classes, if so, when, you, you might know. Uh, and um, if not, uh, or even if so, how does one enroll in, in the classes? I'm sure that's information on the website, but I thought I'd ask you either. Um, I saw Robin Hall just show up like magic because that's like uh, her special um, uh, uh, power. Um, so Pete, first of all, um, we do intend to resume in-person classes. Um, Robin, I'm thinking that that's not going to be till September, but am I lying? I hope I'm not lying. But you're muted, Robin. She shows up, but she hasn't, she doesn't have the superpower of talking yet. <laughs> no, I can't talk. Um... Yeah, we're definitely gonna stay virtual. We have all our virtual classes uh, starting July 12th. And then in the September month, at some point, there will be an in-person, a few in-person sections starting. So Pete, you could definitely join um, uh, in, in July, as Robin was saying, you could start with the Zoom class if you wanted. Also, Rosella hosts a Thursday morning uh, coffee hour where folks can chat and you don't have to make art, but it's part of the, if you're enro enrolled in creative aging, um, you can join Rosella to talk about all the news that's not fit to print. Um, but, uh, but you could definitely start out with, the, with the, the online if you wanted, or you can hold that. And, and um, we're also hoping that, um, um, we had an MOU with uh, uh, Prince George, with the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning to be in five senior centers about, I think it was for last, so it was September, 2020. So um, because the uh, large institution like that works at, at a, a you know, glacial pace, um, 
we're in the process of re, uh, redoing that MOU so that we'll actually be in person at um, five different senior centers um, around the area. And I'm hoping that one of them is in North Brentwood. Um, but uh, um, I think our in-person classes are gonna be smaller, um, partly because of some building use things that we're doing and um, partly because I think that we wanna keep um, smaller numbers until we really, 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 really know things are safe. So, but we'd love to have you. We'd love to have you. Thank you. Anyone else? What should people do if, they're, if they want to get on your email list for Artworks Now creative aging classes? Uh, a couple of things. One, you could uh, email me at barbara at artworksnow.org or robin at robin at artworksnow.org or you can just go to artworksnow.org and uh, there should be a button that says I want to join the email list. But I love hearing from people so um, you're always welcome to send me an email but you can get on that way. Um, also if you're on social media if you're if you're on um, Facebook or Instagram or any of that stuff, um, you can like our page Artworks Now, um, and or follow it uh, on Instagram, and um, we do put a lot of information out uh, about upcoming programs there. Uh, but uh, email is definitely the surest the surest way. So something that that uh, Barbara hasn't mentioned, but. Uh, the creative aging classes, thanks to, I guess, grants that you write over and over again, are offered at no charge. So, of course, contributions to Artworks Now are always welcome. Uh, but we even, during the pandemic, we got supplies delivered to our door. Uh, they did everything but draw and paint for us. So <laughs> uh, it, was, it was quite phenomenal. Well, and, and thank you for mentioning that, Loretta. And, and, and that, that's because... Um, of the recognition that um, a lot of times at a certain age, we end up on a fixed income and our medical expenses can see some increase. And, and we are committed, we are 100% committed to never wanting anyone to be in the position of having decide, to decide between being creative and taking their insulin shot. And so we believe everyone should be able to do both. And I wish I could control the price of insulin, but I can control the price of creativity as far as our provision. And, um, and like you said, every one of the classes, so when it was in person, you would come, you would get a, 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 a kit with a sketchbook and um, the supplies that you use during class were, there you go, were all free. And then that the kit that you got was because you got homework. And I want to speak for a minute about that. And I know we have four minutes left, so I'm going to behave myself. I swear I'm going to try. A lot of times what people offer older people, in my opinion, in our opinion, is insulting. It's, it's very easy peasy craft related stuff that kind of insults your intellect. And and as part of what we did in the Catalyzing Creative Aging program, and, and where I come from as a university educator, is we recognize that um, adults of all ages uh, like to keep learning and growing. And um, so this is, there is no diminishing um, of anyone's intellect by saying, and today we're gonna cut out paper dolls. It, it, it's rigorous. And so you get homework and um, like you don't get in trouble if you don't do it, but you really benefit if you do do it, right? Jean Venus, right? Yeah, that's right. But there's no pressure to do that. And it's all, <clears throat> sorry, it's all incredibly positive. It's truly amazing. I think I've been doing this for three years now. I guess since you started at, the, at this new building and I never would have imagined that I would have that feeling of, that I love you guys so much. <laughs> I know it's, it's true. It's just, and you're all incredibly nice. I mean, and helpful, and you know, couldn't be better. Wow. 
I remember we had to introduce ourselves in the first class that I took at Artworks Now with our association with art. And I remember saying, I don't think I've really drawn anything except stick figures since kindergarten because I decided I wasn't an artist, contrary. I guess I failed on that Ericksonian stage. Someone, so just, failed, someone failed you. Somebody failed. So I just was flipping through mm -hmm. my drawings, and I don't do as many as Jean does, who's amazing. But I No, think, come on. So Look at this. I know, oh. and I really have fun. So um, I want to thank you, Barbara, for giving us time today, when I know you have so much going on in your life. And uh, it's been wonderful for all of us here. You can tell your friends who weren't able to be here that you, you will be getting notices about, with a resource list and a link to the recording so that if you forget what the homework assignment is that Barbara gave us, you can fast forward to it and then uh, listen to her and, and follow those instructions. So I want to thank you on behalf of all of us involved with Corridor Conversations uh, for for leading us today and talking.